Morning, everyone. I'm Edward Gardner. It is my pleasure on behalf of the organizing committee to introduce today's seminar from the Dr. Jean-Francois Couture Lab on the ATXR 5-6 methyl transferases. If you have any questions for the presenters, you can put them in the chat box on the bottom of your screen, and I can relay the questions to the presenters during the question period after their talks. Hossein joined the Couture Laboratory at the University of Ottawa in 2018 for his PhD studies. His research is in the area of structural and functional analyses on nucleosome binding proteins with a focus on the ATXR 5-6 methyltransferases. He previously obtained his MSc degree at York University studying ubiquitin biology and worked on identifying molecular mechanisms and circadian gene expression for his bachelor's degree. So I'll leave that now for Hussein to present his talk to you guys. Uh, well, thanks uh, for the introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, uh, and thank you for being here today. Um, so uh, in uh, in this project, I worked with um, uh, ATXR5 and 6, uh, which are plant uh, metal transferases uh, on uh, for histone. Uh, these are plant uh, histone lysine metal transferases that mono uh, methylate lysine 27 on histone H3. Uh, this is generally a repressive mark, and it's important in DNA replication, DNA repair. It's important for the stability of the genome and organization of chromatin. Uh, these enzymes are characterized by their set domains, which is the catalytic component. They also have nuclear localization signals. Uh, they have PIP motifs, a plant homeo domain or PhD domains, and ATXR5 has an uh, extra signal for for being targeted to the chloroplast. Uh, now, when I uh, took over this project, uh, we came across this piece of data that shows the localization of uh, uh, H3K27 monomethylation visualized by staining of plant nuclei. So uh, on the left here, you're looking at uh, DAPI staining showing uh, uh, total DNA. And on the right side, uh, they used a probe that was specific for monomethylated uh, lysine 27 on histone H3. In uh, normal plant nuclei, we see that these repressive marks are found in uh, condensed uh, chromocenters. Uh, uh, but you see that if they uh, knock out both ATXR5 and 6, this organization uh, is disrupted and the signal is dispersed. And introducing one of these enzymes back into the cell is uh, sufficient to rescue this phenotype. Uh, mutations in uh, either set PhD or the PIP motif uh, of these enzymes is uh, also produces this phenotype. Uh, now our lab has uh, uh, published a number of uh, papers on the role of the set domain and the and the PhD domain. And we have structural and biochemical data that can explain uh, these phenotypes. And Dr. Couture in his presentation will go over the set in the PhD domain. Uh, however, at the time there was no uh, information available to um, understand why mutations in the PIP motif uh, produce the same phenotype. So we started uh, investigating the role of the PIP motif in the context of its anticipated interactor, which is PCNA shown here uh, as a as a donut shaped uh, trimeric protein that encircles DNA uh, and it serves as a binding platform for interaction of many DNA processing uh, proteins. It interacts with DNA polymerases, with DNA repair enzymes, uh, histone chaperones, licensing factor and so on. And many of the proteins that bind PCNA do so via this PIP motif, uh, which is the PCNA interacting peptide motif. And there seems to be a consensus on the sequences uh, in, in the PIP motif. So we formulated our hypotheses around the PIP motif and PCNA and hypothesized that ATXR5 and 6 would directly associate with PCNA via their PIP motifs and that this uh, interaction would modulate the methyl transferase activity of these enzymes on the nucleosome. Uh, we first asked whether the PIP motif in ATXR6 can mediate its direct association with PCNA. To answer that, we incubated a mixture of trimeric PCNA with ATXR6 and loaded the uh, mixture on a size exclusion chromatography and analyzed their elution profiles shown here by these peaks. 
Uh, with uh, wild type ATXR6 and wild type PCNA, we predominantly found one peak that had a molecular uh, size that was heavier than either PCNA alone or ATXR6 alone. And running these fractions on SDS page confirmed that both ATXR6 and PCNA were present in this complex. However, when we used a, PIP, a mutant version of ATXR6 or a PCNA with mutations on the residues known to bind PIP motifs, uh, these proteins failed to form a complex. And instead, uh, we, we, we saw two peaks and uh, these corresponded to PCNA alone or and ATXR6 alone. Now, because uh, size exclusion chromatography uh, only provides approximations for molecular weights, uh, we couldn't tell exactly how many molecules are AT of ATXR6 are bound to PCNA here. Uh, to get, get around that problem, we switched to, uh, and, and to be able to get stoichiometric data, we switched to analytical ultra centrifugation, which is a technique that uses high speed centrifugation coupled with infrared reading to provide a number of useful uh, information, including a much more accurate reading of molecular weight. And we were able to size this complex at 174 kilodaltons, which corresponds to two molecules of ATXR6 bound to the PCNA trimer. Uh, working in a uh, structural biology lab, we are always interested in structures and identifying points of contact. So I used our in-house X-ray generator to solve the structure of ATXR6 with PCNA. I was only successful in crystallizing the PIP motif alone. Um, and I was able to, uh, in context with PCNA, and I was able to get a high resolution of uh, near two angstroms. And from our structures, we found that using the PIP motif alone, there were three uh, PIP motifs bound on the surface of PCNA, uh, one per uh, monomer. We next asked whether PCNA can modulate the activity of ATXR6. To investigate that, we set up a methyl transferase assay using a radioactive uh, methyl donor and uh, the cofactor so that we can visualize a stream methylation on film. Uh, so looking at this assay uh, and looking at the levels of H3 monomethylation on lysine 27, we see that with increasing amounts of PCNA, the methyl, uh, the H3 methylation levels decrease and diminish. Uh, however, using a, a PIP uh, motif mutant uh, ATXR6, which is unable to bind PCNA, this inhibitory effect was lost. Finally, we asked, uh, how does uh, PCNA actually inhibit nucleosome methylation by ATXR6? Uh, to answer this question, uh, I used the electrophoretic mobility shift assays, or EMSA, uh, using non-denaturing acrylamide, uh, which allows protein to migrate uh, down the gel in their native state. Uh, I stained these gels with ethidium bromide, which stains DNA so that I can visualize where the nucleosomes are at. So in this lane, you're looking at nucleosomes alone. When we add ATXR6 to nucleosomes, we see the appearance of a new species that corresponds to the complex of ATXR6 bound to the, nucle bound to the nucleosomes. Uh, however, by adding uh, increasing levels of PCNA, we see that uh, ATXR6 is dissociated and we find nucleosome on its own again. Uh, this data suggests that uh, PCNA is physically outcompeting nucleosomes and it dissociates them from uh, ATXR6. So a uh, quick summary, I was uh, able to show that ATXR6 forms a complex with PCNA and it does so via their PIP motif. Uh, there are two molecules of full-length ATXR6 bound to PCNA. However, using the PIP motifs alone, there would be a three to one ratio of binding. And I showed that PCNA inhibits methylation of, uh, H, uh, inhibits H3 methylation, and that it does so by physically breaking the association of ATXR6 with the nucleosome. Uh, now, the most uh, significant piece of uh, this work was identifying that PCNA is inhibiting uh, H3 methylation. Um, and uh, it's important because uh, PCNA has been thought uh, of as a local carrier uh, of 
enzymes at the replication fork. And uh, for example, uh, the flap endonuclease, which is a PIP motif protein, uh, binds PCNA at the replication fork and it performs this activity while still bound to PCNA. However, my data suggests that this model cannot be uh, the full picture for uh, ATXR6 as it cannot methylate the uh, newly uh, assembled uh, nucleosomes behind the replication fork if it's still bound to PCNA. Uh, also uh, important to mention, we first begin this line of in, uh, investigation by um, this piece of data, uh, which shows the PIP mutants producing this phenotype However, the data I presented doesn't uh, actually provide the direct evidence to account for this, but uh, it adds, uh, it solves a big uh, piece of that puzzle and I'll be happy to uh, uh, go over it more in the questions period. Uh, I'd like to thank my uh, supervisor, Dr. Couture, and uh, our lab members, especially uh, Dr. Michael Joshi, who uh, had primed some of this work before I uh, took it over. Our collaborator at Queen's U who helped us with uh, the AUC experiment and my advisory committee at uh, University of Ottawa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the talk. And as Tony just mentioned, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat window below and, and relay them to Jose in there. And we got a question from Nicole, Francis Nicole here. So PCNA is not loaded on DNA in your experiments. What would you expect the effect of it would be if it was? So in these experiments, uh, it's not we're really just using uh, PCNA alone. Uh, you'd need a number of other uh, components to uh, achieve that, including clamp loaders uh, to put PCNA on uh, DNA. Uh, so the quick answer is that it, we didn't have DNA bound. Um, we, uh, I'm not entirely sure what uh, the effect would be, but we have new evidence that suggests that uh, ATXR6 can actually also interact with DNA, um, but uh, it's not clear exactly if this DNA would be uh, the linear DNA form that's uh, coming out of PCNA or if that DNA would uh, need to be on the nucleosome uh, itself. Uh, so I haven't performed that experiment, but maybe down the line we could uh, take a look at that. Thank you for the answer. And we got... One more question for now, and you can ask some extra questions at the end here too. Um, great talk from Martin Hurst. What is known about the levels of H3K27ME1 following the replication fork? For uh, H3K27 monomethylation, so this mark needs to be uh, reestablished for, uh, it needs to be reestablished post replication and uh, it's associated actually with, with, uh, with uh, DNA replication and also with DNA repair. Um, in, uh, there are other enzymes that also methylate this residue in plants. However, ATXR5 and 6 seems to be responsible for de, de novo uh, incorporation of this mark. So following replication, um, actually these enzymes, are, are, uh, their expression is linked to the cell cycle um, and uh, there's a spike in their uh, levels, uh, which also corresponds with increasing levels of H3 methylation during the replication phase. All right, we have time for, thank you for that. One more question here um, from Michael Hensel. I'm wondering about the concentrations of PCNA required for displacement in vitro and how it compares to the relative concentrations in cells. Um, that's a good question. So we're using the range of PCNA that I'm using to co uh, compete with uh, the nucleosome here is between is up to three micromolar. Uh, but I don't uh, really know <clears throat> in, um, in in vivo setting if that's realistic. Um, it would be something that uh, we could work on with our collaborators who actually work in plant models, uh, maybe to answer that, but um, I, I don't know how closely it would reflect uh, uh, the cell. And uh, there's one more question I can uh, quickly comment about the uh, ATXR6 hindrance. Uh, 
uh, about the discrepancy between uh, the binding of two molecules of the full length versus the three PEP motifs. So that question is also, uh, to answer that question, we would need a structure. Uh, and I'm actually working on uh, getting uh, of the structure of full length ATXR6 bound to the nucleosome. Uh, haven't had any luck with X-ray crystallography, so we're trying that with uh, cryo-EM. Um, but uh, as you suggested, in the absence of the structure, we're left to uh, hypothesize that there may be steric hindrance that uh, is not uh, allowing these uh, proteins to, uh, the full length protein to bind at a three to, three to one ratio in full length. And but I'm saying you have SACS data of ATXR, right? You can talk about the SACS data. I've, yes, I did do SACS, uh, which gave us uh, uh, very low resolution, but we could see an outline. Um, it's uh, from the SACS data, we could, uh, we could see uh, roughly an outline of uh, two uh, blobs protruding out of uh, what we thought looks like PCNA. Uh, but it's not clear the positioning exactly of uh, the, the chunks that we see uh, hanging off uh, the PCNA ring. We don't exactly know uh, how, uh, what the orientation is to, uh, uh, to really answer that question. But hopefully cryo-EM would help us in solving that. Oh, thank you for your great talk and questions, Jose. Thank you. The second talk today will be from Dr. jean Poisson Couture. Dr. Couture obtained his PhD from Laval University in 2003 and subsequently completed postdoctoral studies at the University of Michigan in the laboratory of Raymond C. Treble. In 2007, he joined the University of Ottawa as an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry, Microbiology, and Immunology. He is now a full-time professor and chair of the BMI department. Over the years, the Couture Laboratory has focused on the structural and functional studies of histone methyltransferases as well as various Grimton readers. Today, he'll be presenting his talk on ATXR5, an enzyme at the interface between histone H3 variants and lysine methylation. And with that, I'll leave you to Dr. Couture here. Right, thank you, Edward, for this nice introduction. And thank you again for, for inviting us to present our research this morning to this great community. Uh, so, uh, and uh, thank you, Osain, for this nice introduction. So today I was, um, as I also mentioned, I will just uh, follow up on what he uh, started talking about. And today, um, I just want to focus on this enzyme ATXR5. And just as a, you know, as an entry point in the talk, I, I think this is uh, perhaps a little bit of waste of time to talk about this. But as we know, there's a lot of regulatory elements that control chromatin structure. Uh, it's opening, closing, and three of them uh, uh, could be uh, could be mentioned here. One in the incorporation of histone variants. Uh, we also uh, could talk about as well uh, uh, the post-translational modification of chromatin, as well as in, you can include in, in this DNA methylation. And finally, uh, the remodeling of chromatin using ATP-dependent chromatin remodeling complexes. And obviously, these are represented in silos, but they are very much talked to each other, um, either in cis and trans, and all of them depend on each other heavily. And today, I'm going to show you a very nice example, I believe, of how Eastone variants control the enzymatic activity of a post-translationally modifying enzyme in the name of ATXR5. Um, histone variants, one uh, nice example out there, uh, we all know the canonical histone H3.1 and the variant histone H3.3. They share roughly 95% in sequence identity. This is quite high if you ask me. However, uh, beautiful or, you know, chip seek studies have shown that H3.3 is predominantly enriched active regulatory elements. Uh, so um, this is quite an interesting discrepancy given the, the I sequence identity between the two proteins. Post-translational modification of histone proteins, there are tons out there, phosphorylation, acetylation, methylation of arginine and lysine residues. Uh, they've been documented um, since the 1960s uh, when uh, Alfrey uh, and, and, and many other pioneers in, in, in the field of arginine methylation and, you know, and methylation, lysine methylation and acetylation found that histone protein or these basic proteins could incorporate various radioactive 
a product in their side chains and, and thereby showing that these, these proteins uh, could be heavily post-translationally modified. Uh, today, the only modification I'm gonna be talking about or post-translational modification is lysine methylation. Lysine methylation is catalyzed by many different enzymes. You have DOT1, also we have set domain containing lysine methyl transferase or PR set, which is a new family, an emerging family of lysine methyl transfers that is being investigated by several labs um, uh, out there. Um, and, and, and the story that I, I want to talk about today is ATXR5, as, and as Osain mentioned, ATX5 is, is involved uh, or linked to silencing of repetitive elements in plant. Uh, and, and this is, uh, it's been defined as a mono metal transferase that targets K27. And in this talk, I'm going to try to show you evidence of how this enzyme specifically target H3.1 uh, to deposit K27 mono metal. Um, the piece of evidence that we had back then when we started working on this project, and was it roughly 20, 2013 or something like that, was shown that if you, if you do a knockout of ATXR5 and 6 implants, that leads to over-replication of, of, of DNA. This is illustrated right here. And if you, the same picture that Osteen shown, if you, if you do a knockout of ATXR5 and 6, you lose these chromocenters or this, this punctate enrichment of K27 uh, monometal. Uh, beautiful. Uh, Chip seek studies published by Yumi Stroud in the when he was in, in the lab of Cristando Gutierrez uh, found first they had profiled the distribution of 0.1 and 0.3 across the genome. What they had shown here is that there was somewhat of an anti correlation. So, where you had a 3.1, there were no a 3.3 variant, um, suggesting they were localized in different regions of chromatin. Now, they've done the they, they pushed the, the story a little bit further and they profiled K27 monometallation. Uh, uh, versus the, the E-stone H3.1 and H3.2. And what they found right here is that there was somewhat an, enti an entire correlation of the presence of K27 monometal and the presence of H3.3. So in, in pretty much this, this graph here showed that when you have H3.2, one, you have an enrichment of K27 monometal, which led the, to the very simple question, does ATXR5 methylates only H3.1? Or is there, what is the mechanism that underlie these kind of specificity or this co-enrichment K27 mono and 3.1? So, and, and the, all the work that I'm going to be presented is the work, a beautiful work done by a former postdoc in the lab, Dr. Elisa Bergamin. Now, Elisa is, is, is a team leader at IG, IGBMC in Strasbourg. And the, the, the first question we asked, we our lab asks very simple question. Um, is, is ATXR5 only, does only met or methylate only H3.1? So we did, we reconstitute a nucleosome and perform metal transferase assay here. And we can see that we have nice methylation of nucleosome reconstituted with H3.1. Whereas wherever, wherever, however, when we reconstituted the nucleosome uh, with an a H3.3 variant, we could no longer observe methylation. And that was supported by Michaelis Menten uh, kinetics. As we can see here, we have a very nice KM plot for peptide corresponding to H3.1, whereas we have very low methylation uh, for H3.3. And I should point out that those were performed with peptides. So it means that in that peptide, we had an element that was able to come for some sort of specificity. Now, how, now if you do some sort of, uh, if you do sequence alignment with, between 0.1 and 0.3 here, can see that in vicinity of the K27 methylation side that is right here, there's not much difference. There's a single difference. And this is the substitution of an alanine in 3.1 to a threonine in 3.3. Now, if you go back to your biochem textbooks, this difference is not very high. So we ask a simple question. If we mutate that threonine to an alanine on three point, in, corresponding in 3.1, are we gaining methylation? And indeed, this is what we obtained. Substitution of that threonine 31 in alanine, now we restore methylation, suggesting that, that this switch to A to T, this single difference, this is what's playing a major role in the specificity of ATXR5 for H3.1. 
So as Osin mentioned, we are a structural biology lab, so we crystallize the enzyme corresponding to the you know, construct, corresponding to the set domain with the end set, with the peptide and the cofactor. And we sell the crystal structure at, at very high resolution. As you can see here in green, we have the set domain. In gray, we have the end set region of, of the protein, which does not form the catalytic domain. We have various loops on the structure and the histone H3 pep, uh, peptide, 0.1 peptide, uh, colored in orange. Now, um, quick structural um, comparison of ATXR5 with other uh, set domain lysine methyl transferases reveal that there are a lot or quite a lot of striking or structural differences between ATXR5 and the other enzyme. First of all, in the C-set region, the C-set region is involved in binding the cofactor and also the substrate. What we notice here is that ATXR5, this is a simple loop right here that mean, that does the job here, whereas in all, nearly all the other structure, there was alpha helical element. Now, if we look at the I-set region, this I-set region is directly involved in binding the substrate. And what we found is, again, in contrast with all the other set domain lysine metal transferases, uh, ATXR5 used two loops to coordinate uh, histone binding. And finally, the N-terminus or the N-set region, which typically produces away from the catalytic site, in ATXR5 is quite different. It was packing right on the set domain of the enzyme, likely contributing to its stability. Now, if we look at the surface representation of three representative or ATXR5 with two representative member of the set domain family, we also notice important differences. In contrast to DIM5 and set 8 for example, where the peptide in which the peptide is relatively solvent exposed, you can see the peptide. ATXR5, you can see that the peptide is completely shielded from the environment. And essentially this, and we refer this, this, this kind of bridge that kind of shield the peptide, we call this a safety belt. And, and, and we're gonna focus on that a few minutes. And in this region of the peptide, we call the, the selectivity pocket. Now let's go back to this allylene 31, the key element making the difference between a bad and a good substrate for ATXR5. What we found is if we zoom on the specificity pocket, we can see here that allylene 31 is nicely nestled in a very tight pocket here formed by various residues in the catalytic domain and the loops that I talked about. And it's, it's so essentially it's a very narrow pocket. Now, if you start modeling a training residue in that position, and this is what we've done using quantum molecular uh, mechanics studies, you can see that it generates a lot of clashes with one of the side chain arginine 34 here, suggesting that even the simple change from an allylene to threonine create enough clashes to disrupt the binding of ATXR5 to histone or to that to histone H3.3, explaining why ATXR5 is unable to methylate histone H3.3. Now, this is very nice, but this is all in vitro. So our collaborator, Rob Martinson, at the time decided to push these, uh, these findings a little bit further. And he created plant cell lines that in which we had substituted an H3.1A to a T, making this likely this histone um, less suitable for methylation. And accordingly, what we found is that similar to the knockout uh, knockout, the double knockout in plan of ATXR5 and 6, you can see low level of K27 methylation and then substitution of this H3.1 in plan with a mutant, again, that can no longer be methylated, resulted in, this, in a similar decrease of K27 monomethylation in plan. So that's good. That makes sense. That was making sense with our in vitro data. Now they perform an additional experiment and they look at a specific, a specific region or an element that is systematically transcriptionally silent in plants and in which you have an enrichment of H3.1 and then introduction. And again, here, introduction of that mutant of H3.1 in plant resulted in a derepression of this TSI region, suggesting that K27 monomethylation was a key player in maintaining the silencing of that region. Now, if we can take, if, it, if we, we have a take home message of, 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 of the first part of this talk, why this finding was um, interesting, we think, is that for the first time, we believe that we had 
determined that e-stone proteins are direct modulator of chromatin modifying enzyme. In, instead of the, the thought at times that all oh, e-stone proteins are passive molecules and it's being mod modified that they're going to start uh, and encoding or you know uh, triggering molecular uh, effects. Whereas in this case, we demonstrated that no, it's the other way around. The e-stone variants will control the type of modifications that will deposit it on them and thereby contribute to any type to, in this particular case, silencing to a biological output. Now, we had other key questions to look at when we, uh, we, uh, we, we saw the crystal structure and Elisa was really interested in looking and in, in studying or looking at what kind of motif is recognized by ATXR5. This is quite telling because sometimes we can use that information to find new substrate. So essentially, if, if we look at different motifs that are, are out there or that are, you know, that are recognized by different lysine metal transferases, you can see here, for example, and I'm going to bring your attention to, to DIM5, which is, which is a K9 metal transferase versus VSET, which is a K27 metal transferase. We found that nearly all the residues that are important or conferring specificity are found on the C-terminal end of the lysine residue. The reason is very simple. If you look at the other residues that are end terminus of these two methylation sites, they're quite unique, or they're, no, sorry, they're quite identical, suggesting that these, these two enzymes, the readout mechanism occurs at the C terminus. And we wanna know whether ITXR5 was, sim what was similar to that or not. So very simple, we cross-link uh, pep uh, various peptides um, uh, on, on the membrane in which uh, the only thing that was uh, kept constant is the centralizing here. And then we substituted every flanking uh, residues with all other natural amino acids. And we use these arrays to perform uh, methylation reactions. As we can see here, consistent with our crystal structure, which shows that these residues are relatively solvent exposed. We can see here in the peptide array, in blue means lost methylation, red means gain of methylation, white, same methylation. Essentially, the residues that are solvent exposed here are relatively, um, there's relatively relative flexibility in terms of, 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 of uh, you know, um, uh, in terms of specificity of the enzyme. Uh, and, and again, consistent with our crystal structure where we have this safety belt, nearly every single substitution uh, on the peptide result in a loss of methylation. So right now we're exploring what kind of other, using these motifs, we're exploring what could be the other substrates for ATXR5. As Osain mentioned, uh, one of the ATXR5, or the, one of the ATXR have a chloroplast signaling uh, uh, signals suggesting that there might be other substrates for this enzyme in other organelles at the plant. Um, Close uh, cl uh, um, analysis of, of our motif analysis also suggested that very similar to VSET, which is the other K27 methyl transferase, and by the way, this is a viral set enzyme, the motif that was recognized by ATXR5 was very similar to the VSET. Now, another thing that can modulate the activity of methyl transferases is the impact of post translational modification in the vicinity of the K27 metal site. So we wanted to test this, uh, what kind of modification that this enzyme could tolerate um, uh, potentially. So to do that, so uh, if we look at different modifications that takes place around K27 right here, you have asymmetric uh, methylation by CARM1 or R26. You have RORB that phosphorylate S28. And we also you have K36 that is methylated by the NSDs or uh, the CD2s. Um, so those are the three modifications that, the, that Elisa looked at, what could be their impact on, on the activity of ATXR5. And essentially when she tested the impact of methylation on R26, uh, she didn't observe any kind of changes or impact on, on, um, on the activity of ATXR5 uh, and 6. And, and it, so we, we were surprised by this finding because this arginine side chain makes a lot of interaction with the protein and is quite in cave in the pocket. However, when we saw the crystal structure of the mono and the dimethylated um, 
a peptide on R26, we found that actually this arginine has the ability to reorient its side chain to maximize other type of interactions, which explains the lack of inhibition or lack of impact of this modification on ATXR5 activity. Now, and conversely, we tested, um, Oh, yeah. So conversely, we tested the, uh, the impact of S28 phosphorylation and K36 methylation on the activity of ATXR5. And what we found in this particular example is that phosphorylation of S28 completely killed the activity of ATXR5. And this is not surprising because if you look at the serine here, this is right under the safety belt, making tons of interactions. So you can easily see that adding a phosphate moiety right here will clash significantly with, with the protein. Similarly, if we look at K36, the side chain and the, the epsilon amine of the, of, the, of the lysine side chain here makes a lot of, of, of strong, uh, likely, um, cell bridges with the protein, explaining that adding a three methyl group on this side chain could easily disrupt the activity of the protein. So conclusion for this section, VSET and ATXR5, two histone x 3 k 27 methyl transfers recognize a similar set of residues on histone x 3 and two marks, serine 28 phosphorylation and K36 trimethylation block ATXR5 enzymatic activity. Now, the last domain that I didn't have a chance to talk about, it's the PhD domain. When we started looking at the, uh, at the structure and, and, and trying to, and further um, understand the role of this domain, there was already a beautiful piece of data published by Yannick Jacob when he was in Rob Martinson lab, and he had pe performed peptide pull down experiments showing that the PhD domain of ATXR5 cannot bind to a peptide that is uh, trimethylated on lysine 4 of histone H3, which makes sense because if you think about it, ATXR5 and 6 uh, couldn't not bind to K4 trimethylation, which is typically found in, in, in region of chromatin that have active regulatory elements. So essentially it makes sense that such mark would prevent methylation of K27, a repressive mark. In the case of, of a repetitive chromatin, you would have a non-methylated form of a K4 that would be recognition, and then there would be, you know, essentially methylation of K27. So we are structural biologists. We were interested in understanding the crystal structure of the PhD domain of ATXR5 bound to histone H3. So essentially what we find here is that this is a surface representation of PhD domain. And in yellow, this is the end terminus of histone H3. And you can see that there's a lot of interactions and we'll just focus on K4 here for, for to be mindful of time. And, and K4 here make two very short interactions back with, with residues found on the PhD, which explains very well, you know, the previous findings that Yannick had made back in the days that, you know, indeed, uh, K4 trimethylation blunts the binding of the PhD domain of ATXR5 to an histone H3.1. One thing that I would like to bring attention here is that leucine 39 right here that makes a, 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 a hydrophobic contact I'm almost done, hydrophobic contacts with the arginine side chain. So when, and, and so we use that structure to, 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 uh, to, to test the impact of the PhD domain on the methylation of the nucleosome. When we perform methyl transferase assay on a nucleosome, we had this mutant here, L39W. We had a construct that we had removed the PhD domain and we had the full end construct. Contrast to the full end construct, we can see that either removing the PhD or the point mutant has a detrimental effect on the activity on the metal transferase activity of ATXR5. So based on these results, one might conclude that the loss of activity is due to the loss of binding to the end terminus of histone H3. So to make sure that it was the case, we performed a, a michaelis menten constant kinetics and binding assay to determine the KM and the KD. To our, to our surprise, what we found is that methylation reaction with the nucleosome core particle, we changed the nucleosome core particle concentration right here, resulted in KM and KDs that were absolutely identical between the three constructs that we tested. The one without PhD, the one with the mutation on the PhD, and the full end protein, suggesting at least in vitro that the PhD domain doesn't seem to be involved in the binding or contributing to increase the binding to the nucleosome. Then we turn around and say, okay, what about the cofactor? 
cofactor is the SAM. This is the methyl donor. Repeat the same experiments. Now, the surprise here was that the SAM binding was impacted as illustrated by the gain or increased value in the KM and the KD, suggesting that the PhD domain in regard to binding a nucleosome has absolutely no impact. However, the binding of the cofactor is the molecular event in that process that is affected. Now, OSAN is working right now to try to solve that puzzle. But the take home message of this is that the PhD domain of ATXR5 does not seem to participate in the binding of the nucleosome in vitro, therefore likely not involved in the tethering of the enzyme to chromatin. And there are other examples of that. A re and, and then the other take home message is that a reader domain may carry out other functions than just merely acting as a recruitment module. So I'm going to hand there. Uh, I will thank Elisa, who uh, carried out, uh, again, uh, the two, uh, all the work for the two papers we're publishing, and then Osain, who beautifully uh, took over that project, Monica, collaborators, Rob at Cold Spring, and now Yannick, uh, with whom I have several ongoing collaboration at Yale University and, and, uh, and, and many other people in the lab. Uh, and I'll take questions. Thank you very much. And we got a question here. Great talk. Does mutating the alanine on H3.1 prevent modifications such as H3, K27, ME3 by other enzymes? That's a good question. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I don't think they've looked at that. Um, I think the analog of EZH2 is called curly and media in plant. Uh, I don't think they've looked at that. However, um, I think Danny Reinberg published a couple of papers on this, that EZH1 and EZH2 uh, can start with a monomethyl K27. So I would anticipate that there would, could likely have an impact on K27 trimethylation. Ah, we got good it. question. Uh, very cool. Just wondering how does K27 mono repress transcription in plants? So there's a paper just published, uh, I think a few months ago, December 2020 in, most, in plant cell by uh, Yannick actually, and showed that um, K27 monomethylation serves to protect uh, K27 and K36 uh, acetylation from GCN5. So in plants, if you do a single double of five and six, uh, you have all these defects. If you do a triple mutant and you delete G9A on top of that, that bypass the defects. So pretty much the, the model is that K27 mono protects against over, um, over acetylation of H3.1 and protect chromatin. Now, they haven't looked into pushing this as to which domain could be recognized by K27 in region that are D. I would say deprotected or you know or reprotected um, in the absence of of, of of a five and six, but that's the the model that is considered right now. Yes, Nicole, I think <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, there was a story uh, um, by on another enzyme. Um, not, I don't remember. I think this is one of the SUVAR. It was not a PhD per se, but it was believed to be a to believe believed to be a chromatin reader. And, and turns out that the cofactor was affected in the binding. So I think that um, I would not be surprised. Um, it's just and and we've the data that I'm not showing is that we found that once the PhD. So if we take the set domain alone. Okay, and we bind a PhD domain with peptide, isonic three peptide, it binds to the set domain. If the peptide is not there, it does not bind to the set domain. So somehow there's an interplay between binding of the n terminus of isonic three, coordination of the set domain, and perhaps even release. Because there's something that we don't talk about often in enzyme or you know, just mechanism. We always interested in binding. Right, an enzyme will bind to this, will do an activity, but we're never interested in release. What's releasing the enzyme? What the enzyme, how the enzyme is, is, is let go? And this is something that Osin is, is working on right now with PCNA and the interplay between the two. And that was a surprise when you found there was competition there. But I think that the PhD may sense the methylation or the end of the methylation reaction to let probably the enzyme go. Yeah, Jeff, that's a good question. So indeed, so this is a serine in, in mammals. Uh, we believe that the mechanism in mammal, and, and perhaps you know it, it could be true as well in plant, but I, I haven't looked much into treonine phosphorylation in plant. 
uh, but it is true. So, but serine, uh, the corresponding serine in, in, in mammals is phosphorylated. So the mechanism is, is a little bit more complicated. Obviously the changes um, there's, and again, to perhaps take a few steps back, ATXR5, despite the fact that we've been searching for three or four years now, we, st we still haven't found an analog of ATXR5 and 6 um, in mammals. Um, despite the fact that Danny Reinberg had published a beautiful paper with, which he had knocked down EZH1 and EZH2, and, are, you know, and in one of the figure, he, uh, you, know, you lose K27 try, you, you lose K27 die, but you do not lose K27 mono. Mono is constantly there. So what's going on? Is there an enzyme or is just that, or perhaps this is an interplay between demetallases that are able to only bring this back to mono and not to unmetallated? I don't know, uh, but yeah. Hey, looks like there's no more questions yeah. coming in there. Uh, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Couture and Hussein for your great talks or excellent questions brought up in there. Very interesting work. Thank forward you. to see what comes out of your lab in the future. <laughs> Good. After, once COVID is over. Yeah. <laughs> that will certainly <laughs> help with the yeah. work. <laughs> thank you, Edward, again for the invitation. Right. Really yep. Thank great. you for coming and appreciate yep. you bringing your talks here. Great. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>